Welcome to the ATRA webinar series. In this series, we're going to discuss the GM throttle actuator control system that is so prevalent on GM vehicles today. My name is Steve Garrett, and we're going to take a look at the different versions of the different tax systems that is used across the board on GM applications. We're going to discuss the operation of the system itself, some basic service information, and some basic diagnostic trouble codes that you may occur, uh, run across when you're dealing with these uh, GM throttle actuator control systems. Now the TAC system itself was introduced first on the 1994 GM truck applications with the 6.5 liter EFI diesel uh, motors. This was the first application that we actually had uh, a system that controlled your throttle opening through the use of electronics rather than a throttle cable. So these systems do not use throttle cables. They simply use electronics to control the operation of the throttle plates themselves. In 1997, it was introduced in the YCAR applications, so the Corvette applications of the 5.7 liter LS1. And by, 19, by basically 2004, just about every GM vehicle had been converted over to the TAC system itself. You're also going to hear it called electronic throttle control, or ETC, depending on whose uh, publication you actually look at. So some applications call it a TAC system. Some applications call it an ETC system. Both are referring to the exact same thing. Reason for having a TAC system itself, improved emissions, better fuel economy, uh, better throttle response and drivability, but the biggest reason is reduced cost. You don't have a cruise control system because it's all done electronically. You don't have a reason for an idle air control valve or idle speed control motor because, uh, again, this can be done electronically by controlling the throttle plate position. And, of course, along with that, you don't have a throttle cable or any linkage uh, that can malfunction, causing you uh, unintended acceleration issues. The components that you're going to run into first thing you're going to notice is the accelerator pedal itself does not have a cable attached to it. The accelerator pedal has a assembly hook to it which contains some potentiometers. There will either be two potentiometers or three potentiometers built into the throttle pedal assembly itself uh, depending on your particular application. So bottom line, we've got some that actually have three sensors not inside of the pedal assembly itself where all three sensors are being used. Some actually have three sensors mounted in the inside of it, but only two of those are actually used. And some applications only have two sensors mounted on the inside of it. Depends on the year of the vehicle and the particular application. This is a look at a typical APP sensor, accelerator pedal position sensor. This is what's replaced your throttle cable assembly right here. As you can see, we've got the pedal uh, on the right-hand side there, which is attached to a lever assembly and that lever assembly moves a series of potentiometers that are mounted inside the APP assembly. So there will be multiple pins that are plugged into some sort of controller, and that controller will then read the position of those sensors to figure out exactly where uh, your pedal position is actually at. This is a look at the first design system. This was the 6.5 EFI application. Uh, the 6.5 EFI application used, as you can see, three separate sensors, APP1, APP2, and APP3. And it actually used all three of these sensors. And so these were typical potentiometers, nothing different than you've dealt with in the years past. Uh, the difference here was each sensor registered a different amount at a certain fixed throttle opening. So we used that as a correlation input so we could tell exactly what the throttle opening was as well as used as an input to determine if we had a diagnostic problem with this system or not. This chart showing you how the sensor voltages would vary depending on what you actually had. The blue line, as you can see, is APP number one, and it moved from about a volt or so up to about, oh, around two volts at wide open throttle. APP number two, as you can see, moved from about two and a half volts up to about four and a half volts or so at wide open throttle. APP number three, it changed obviously from about four volts down to about three volts in that neighborhood. So your variance that you would have would be different depending on which sensor 
was registering as your input. We used that information so we could correlate diagnostics to tell if we had a faulty sensor or not. So here were some typical uh, APP values. This happens to be the Duramax, and it's again a little bit different than what you've dealt with with the 6.5 diesel. But the bottom line is, as you can see here, we've got an APP1, an APP2, and an APP3. At idle, number one is reading about 0.7 volts, number two is reading about 4.3 volts, and number three is reading about 4 volts. As you step on the gas, APP number one increases in value. So we're seeing APP number one actually rising to approximately 1.3 volts at 50% throttle open. But APP number two is dropping in value. So it's going backwards. So we started high, we're going low. Okay, kind of like we did on the 6.5 diesel. APP number three is starting at about 4 volts, dropped in about 3.6 volts as we get to 50% throttle open. We get the wide open throttles. You can see this one, the voltage is still going up, rising from about 1.3 to about 2.5. This one's continuing to drop. This one here is continuing to drop. Notice that each of those voltages, as we change it, we can correlate the position of the sensor itself by looking at each of the different voltage values coming from the sensor. We also again use that for diagnostics so we can tell if one of the sensors is faulty or not. There are three types of APP systems that are actually out on the market. Three different designs. Several different manufacturers, but three different designs. Here we're showing you a typical type 1 gas application. This is an older design system as it was introduced in the late 1990s, early 2000 range, where they actually had a standalone TAC module. That stands for Throttle Actuator Control Module. So your APP sensors that were mounted on your accelerator pedal, those sensors are going to be variable potentiometers, and they're going to be sending a signal, obviously, to the TAC module itself. So the TAC module is a separate module, and they receive their input from each of the different sensors, correlate that input, figure out what the actual percentage of throttle opening is, and then they send that information along to the PCM. So the PCM has fed that information directly from the TAC module itself. The PCM, via serial data, feeds that information along to the TCM so we can control transmission shift operation. So as you can see, it was a very convoluted, very complicated system where you fed from the sensor, from the pedal itself, to a module, from that module to another module, from that module to another module, to come up with exactly what the throttle opening was for your transmission shifts. Starting with the 2004 model year, they started changing how the sensors actually operated. Some of the earlier model, uh, mid-range 2000 year applications, they actually had three sensors on the inside of the APP assembly, but the throttle actuator control module never used the third sensor. In later years, they got rid of that third sensor so that you no longer even have it there. But the earlier model applications, you would see a third sensor input the wiring, everything was there. They simply ignored the signal itself, so it was never actually as a functional sensor. They moved from a three-sensor unit over to a two-sensor unit. So as they needed some cost containment, they figured, hey, we need to get rid of that extra sensor that we're not using. So they found out that the reliability of these sensors were pretty good. They didn't need that third sensor, so they got rid of it. Is that the first application to do that was a 2006 GTO. And as you can see here, the pedal does look a little bit different than what you had before. That would be considered the Type 2 type sensor assembly. This assembly feeds information from your APP directly back into your ECM. So your raw APP values, instead of going into a TAC module and being buffered there, they're fed directly from the sensor pod itself right back into the ECM. So that eliminates the need to have that extra module. So in a Type 2 system, you don't have a standalone TAC module. That TAC module is obviously, its function is taken over by the engine control module. You still have your components on the throttle body to control the operation of the throttle plates. So you're going to have your TAC motor, 
that actually is a stepper motor that we control the opening and closing of the throttle plates with. And then you're going to have a series of TP sensors. The TP sensors actually tell us the position of the throttle plates themselves. So effectively what we're going to do is as you step on the gas pedal, your APP sensors send a signal to your ECM. Your ECM then determines your need for throttle opening. It then commands the TAC motor to open the throttle plate. It then uses the information coming back from the two potentiometers called the TP sensors mounted on the throttle body itself to determine if, in fact, the command for the TAC motor itself is correct or not. If it thinks it needs to open the motor a little bit more, based on your TP command, uh, it will then simply command the motor on a little bit, obviously, wider uh, pulse width. If it thinks that, obviously, the motor is a little too far open, then it will, in turn, command the motor to a more closed position. You're going to find with these systems, the gasoline powered systems, that you're always going to have some sort of, of uh, signal that comes off the APP system and there's also going to be a feedback sensor uh, signals that actually come off the TP sensors. So here we're looking at the APP sensors themselves on type 2. APP sensor number 1 and APP sensor number 2 are both contained in the uh, pedal assembly itself and the APP assembly. As you can see, as we step on the gas pedal, the voltages start low, and of course the voltages go higher as we open the throttle plates. You're always going to have to have some sort of TAC control module, whether that's done externally through an external TAC control module, or whether that's actually done uh, via the ECM or PCM on that vehicle. So we're going to have to take that raw data off of the TAC APP sensors themselves and convert that over into an actual throttle opening. That throttle opening is, is then used to command the TAC motor open or closed. And then we're going to look at the position of the potentiometers mounted on the throttle plate to determine where that motor actually is going to. In other words, is it open the correct amount or not? So we've got three different configurations of this system as we talked about a little bit earlier. Some run a separate TAC module. Some run a TAC module itself, obviously, that's incorporated into the throttle body. And some run no TAC module at all. Uh, they're actually doing the TAC module functioning inside the engine controller. This is a look at a 2005 Silverado. Uh, that body style had a separate TAC module. So in this instance, you would have your raw data coming off your APP sensor, coming into the TAC module itself, and then the TAC module then commands the APP motor, or I should say the uh, TAC motor itself, to move to a given position. It then uses the potentiometers mounted on the uh, throttle plates themselves to tell us if we've reached that position or not. Here shows you one of the later applications here. This is a 2004 W car application. So this would be like a Grand Prix or a Lumina application right here, showing you the TAC motor and module assembly built into one piece. So this one is, is an example here, has the motor and the module and the TP sensors all as one assembly here to control the operation of the throttle plates. It really doesn't make any difference which type you've got. The functionality is basically the same. Here it looks at an XLR with an ECM controlled TAC system. So in this instance, we've got the potentiometers mounted in our pedal assembly feeding information back, voltage values back based on our throttle position. The ECM then buffers that data, figures out what our actual throttle position is, figures out what the command needs to be for the TAC motor to control the position, position of the throttle plate itself. And then we use our potentiometers mounted on the side of the throttle body to tell us if, in fact, that command for that motor is correct or not. As you can see there, there are four different brand motors and throttle body configurations used. Uh, the type that's used is dependent on the engine family and, of course, the vehicle platform. They're all very similar as far as operation is concerned. They all have bidirectional control, and their frequency and pulse of modulated control, and the spring-loaded throttle plate is, is loaded into the closed position. 
This shows you a Siemens system here used on many of the passenger car applications. It uh, has a six-way connector on the bottom of it, uh, throttle body assembly on the side of the assembly itself, and of course, it's going to have a standalone tack module. Here shows you the Pureberg style, used on many of the uh, passenger car applications also. Same type of thing, you're going to be able to ID this one because it's got an eight-way connector on it. The Atachi style also uses an eight-way connector on the throttle body. And as you can see, the uh, TAC module itself is right there also. Delphi assembly, the TAC module is mounted as part of the throttle body itself and uses a 20-way connector. The TP sensors are mounted on the throttle body. And those TP sensors are my input back to the processor to tell us if, in fact, the command for the TAC motor is correct or not. So it determines the actual position of the throttle plate. As you can see here, on a three APP system, a type one system, at idle, TP number one will typically read about 0.98 volts. As you step on the gas pedal, that voltage on TP number one is going to go up. TP number two, conversely, will go backwards. As you can see here at idle, it's about four volts. As we step on the gas pedal, the voltage, of course, is going to drop. So we're using that cross voltage, and there is that correlation voltage, to tell us, in fact, we have a diagnostic issue with these sensors. That's the reason they operate backwards of each other. So when the electronics weren't as good as they are today, they actually ran the voltages backwards so we could come up with a diagnostic uh, process for figuring out if we had a TP sensor problem or not. If you have a Type 2 system itself, as you can see here, the voltage starts out on TP number one at about 0.7 volts and rises to approximately 4 volts at wide open throttle. TP number two starts out at 0.7 volts and rises to a little less than 4 volts at wide open throttle. So as you guys can see, uh, the three uh, sensor system uses a different voltage range on the TP sensors than the two sensor system uses. So my whole point to this is you need to know which type of system you have to be able to diagnose it correctly. This is a look at how the TP sensor is actually mounted to the throttle body. So the TP sensor is bolted on the side of the throttle body. Your motor assembly is bolted on the opposite side of the throttle body to control the position of the throttle plates. Service diagnostic actions. Some pretty complicated things this thing does. Uh, for service operations. It does have a throttle body relearn. And anytime you disconnected the battery on this thing, it has to go through and relearn this. The system does it automatically, one time per key cycle, and it relearns the rate of the spring itself. So we're saying here all values are over overwritten if the PCM or ECM is replaced, reprogrammed, or the battery is disconnected. If it erase, the, the relearn occurs as soon as the key is cycled on with the engine off, for longer than 29 seconds. So if somebody goes the key on but does not start the engine, it goes through the relearn process. That means to you in simple terms, you're going to hear this motor operate. That is considered normal. In order for a relearn to be functional, you've got to have less than 40 RPM engine input, you've got to be stationary, you've got to have the engine fairly warm, an APP uh, reading of less than 14.9%, which basically means you got to have be a closed throttle, and you got to have the battery fully charged. So after 29 seconds of key on, it physically then forces the, the throttle plate to the 10% position itself, and then back into the closed position. That relearns the throttle spring, so it knows how much force it's going to take to physically then open the throttle plate. You're going to find a counter on your scan tool, uh, as we're saying here, the relearn counter itself will display 0 and then go up to 11 as the throttle body process is completed. On your Type 1 systems, there are some default actions that can occur if there's some sort of malfunction with this system itself. As you can see, we've got five modes available. We have accelerator limiting. So in other words, it limits how far you can actually push the accelerator. Limited throttle limits the max throttle no matter where you put the accelerator. You're not going to be able to go too fast. Throttle default turns off the tack motor. That basically leaves you at idle position. Forced idle limits the engine speed. 
So you will not obviously have uh, the abilities to race the engine. It will limit how fast the engine can actually run. And engine shutdown mode. If you have if entering engine shutdown mode, it disables the fuel system and basically leaves you uh, with the engine shut off. Some of the modes that we're talking about here are going to set DTCs to indicate to you the area that there's a problem. Some of the modes will also turn on the reduced power light. So anytime you see the reduced power light coming on, that means there has to be a default in that system someplace. Your Type 2 systems, they only have two types of reduced power modes available. On a, in Mode 1, APP or TP sensor fault, it's going to operate in reduced power, and it's going to limit engine torque. And vehicle speed is limited to 60 miles an hour. That, of course, will last for the duration of the key cycle. In mode two of operation, it's going to command the throttle actuator, which is going to vary its position itself. Uh, and you're going to also limit engine speed to 2,500 RPM. And this is kind of interesting here. It shuts off fuel injectors to limit the amount of power available from this engine. You will also have a reduced power light that comes on. And of course, you're going to probably get some DTCs that are going to be set based on this. You will find several different DTCs available for these systems. A 1220, 1221, 1222, excuse me, 1275, 1276, 1280, 1281. These are the most common codes you get into. As you can see, each code looks at different sensor inputs. And we're going to give you a list of these codes, obviously, as part of the webinar, so that you can use that for diagnostics. 1285, 1286, showing you what it's looking at. Type 2 systems, we got a 2108 available, a 2120, a 2121, a 2125, a 2135. Again, different codes are going to set for different types of system failures. So you're going to use a diagnostic chart and the shop manual to help you isolate what the cause of that code is. But any of these codes that are set can limit engine power, can affect transmission operation. There were some uh, DTC changes in the mid-2000 range. We're showing you here a 1518 DTC was changed to a U1007. Uh, so that U1007 uh, was, in fact, a serial data fault for the tax system itself. Uh, that was simply an update to the software because they changed the code number. Well, that well pretty well concludes our presentation for today on the GM tax systems, giving you a little introduction to the system itself, which you can expect to see. The queue is free of questions. So with that said, have a nice day, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thanks for attending.